live with the community. This is the Microsoft 365 Development Bi-Weekly Call. Today is February 3rd. My name is David Warner with Catapult, and I will be your host for the day. Let's begin talking about our agenda. We've got a number of PNP initiatives we're going to discuss today. PNP Framework and Core SDK, PowerShell, Yo, Teams, Script Samples, Microsoft Graph Toolkit, oh my, so many more. We've got samples of plenty, Microsoft Teams, Power Platform, and then of course we're going to do the ever popular Together Mode picture where we're all going to wave and show what an awesome community you all are. Our rock stars of the day are Lee Ford, Albert John Schott, or otherwise known as Appy, Natalie, and Troy. And they're going to talk about making a simple bot using webhooks in Teams, uh, make use of the Power Platform and Microsoft Teams to quiz yourself. And then we're going to see some updates on the independent publisher connectors with a Cloverly and Ecology connector demo. So some very, very cool stuff. Let's begin, though, talking about some opportunities that you may have to participate in the community. The first is we'd love to see a demo of a solution or a technical pattern that you may have, maybe a sample that you've created that you'd love to show off to uh, everyone in the community, how you created it, the thought process, and what you did. Uh, you can also contribute those samples if you haven't already to GitHub. We'd love to see them. Uh, absolutely welcome that. And uh, we've even got some opportunities that help show you how to do that. We'll talk about those in a moment. And of course, we'd love to get feedback, whether it's constructive or positive. All feedback is welcome. Uh, we just ask that you keep it positive. And again, if you'd like to request a demo, you can do that at the aka.ms URL seen there or in your chat. So please don't hesitate to get involved. There are many opportunities and we would love to see you do more in the community. Amongst all of the resources that are available for you to do all of those wonderful things, begin with some videos. So we've got Microsoft 365 developer videos and community videos, uh, things that are going to show you directly from Microsoft how to accomplish and take advantage of some of the solutions and features, as well as these calls and many other by members of the community. You can get to those at the two URLs available there on the left. Our open source initiatives are many as well. We've got CLIs and toolkits, a plenty, plenty of opportunities for you to do more with the solutions that you are creating uh, in a more rapid pace. So you can get those at a variety of URLs as well into the open source column. And then of all these samples that we've been talking about, they are available to you for free. Members of the community, just like you, are making amazing samples for us to use and build upon. Team samples, SPFX samples, Power Platform samples, uh, extensions, list formatting, ACES, oh my, so, so many. Uh, don't hesitate to take advantage, and we do welcome your samples to be put into those. But you don't have to remember all these URLs. There's only one that you need to use, aka.ms forward slash m365pnp. Let's begin with one of those initiatives, script samples, and for that, we'll hand the mic over to Paul Bullock. Hello, everybody. Thank you, David. Uh, so PMP Script Samples is a site for sharing scripts well, for automating tasks within Microsoft 365. So that could be whether uh, with uh, Microsoft Graph, CLI, PMP PowerShell. Uh, it's, it's, it, there's no strict limits on it, which is pretty cool. Um, we've been doing some work to integrate the, uh, just to reiterate, we integrate the script samples gallery into the universal sample gallery now so that you'd be able to see those samples in that location and in the, uh, the site that you see in the screenshot in front of you. Um, I've been doing some uh, refinements and bug fixes. Like all bug fixes, I fix one and three more pairs, so I've got a bit more work to do in that space. Um, so continually working on that. We've got a couple of new scenarios and three script updates from our contributors, which is absolutely awesome. So thank you very much for that. So thank you to Adam, Adam Wolchak, Casper uh, Bolarson, Liam Armston, and Ryan Haley. Um, and also there is, uh, we've also introduced a badge. So hopefully those are on the way to you for your contribution. So I uh, thank you very, very much. Um, if you want to find out more about the repo, please go to aka.ms forward slash script hyphen samples. Over to you, David. Awesome. Thank you, Paul. And a great opportunity to get involved. So many uh, wide spectrum tools available in that repo. So don't hesitate to, to use them and, and get more involved. And we'd love to celebrate you with that badge. Now, how could you get more involved in some of these initiatives if you would like to? Well, uh, Sharing is Caring is a program within the PNP community that allows you to get hands-on guidance. So we will work with you to do things like submit your first pull request if you'd like some tips and tricks on how to get more involved uh, in presenting. Uh, just to make you comfortable, or if you'd like to start contributing to Power Platform samples. These are live hands-on sessions, safe space opportunities that are not recorded, great ways to get more involved with the community and collaborate with others in the community, get to know one another. They are regularly scheduled throughout the month and are absolutely free of charge. We've got our Viva Connections ACES coming up soon. Uh, our SPFX Developer Workstation setup session is next week. 
and we've got two up and coming ask me anythings around PNP react controls and MGT. And we know that PNP JS 3.0 is going to be dropping really, really soon. So we're going to have an AMA set up for that. So be on the lookout. Now, once you have contributed uh, in a variety of ways, we absolutely want to celebrate it. And we are now able to do that in a formal and official way. The PNP Recognition Program showcases your contributions and is powered by Credly by providing you badges that are the same badges that you get when you are Microsoft certified. They sit right alongside those. Uh, you're able to share them on LinkedIn, able to share them on Twitter, put them on your website, add them to your resume. We absolutely want to ensure that you are recognized and celebrated for this work. We are adding more and more badges you just saw the script samples blog authors independent publisher connectors spfx samples sharing is caring we have so many more coming pnp powershell uh, and we want to get you more involved and we're gonna have some fun initiatives as well along the way we do need you to opt in aka.ms forward slash m365 pnp dash recognition so that we can tie your account to your uh your credly account or email address to all the work you're doing in the community now, the agenda for our Microsoft 365 platform call on the 8th of February is with Dave Randall, Patrick Rogers, and Sebastian Levert. Uh, this is the Microsoft platform call, which means that it is going to be presentations directly from Microsoft. So if you're looking to get it straight from the mothership and you want to know that it is going to put you in the know, these are a must to attend. Uh, we're going to see Intune APIs on Microsoft Graph. We're going to see more Viva Connections mobile experiences from Patrick and Sebastian has an awesome series around using MGT, which stands for Microsoft Graph Toolkit. Those components are absolutely lifesavers and save a ton of time. So you can get a recurrent invite from aka.ms forward slash M365 dev call. Now let's move into PNP.net libraries and I'll hand it over to Bert. Thank you, David. On the PNP.NET library side, for PNP Framework, uh, not that much happened actually the last two weeks. Uh, this series of pending PRs that we have to merge, which will make work for in, in the coming week. Uh, on the cross the case side, however, things did change. There is a pending PR from Marcin uh, that brings Viva Connection support. So you will be able to um, programmatically uh, add ACES to your Viva Connections dashboard. Uh, and in a typed manner. So as a developer, you don't even have to write JSON anymore. You can just create a class uh, that defines an ACE and put it on the dashboard. And so that's really great stuff. Uh, thank you, Marcin, for doing that uh, awesome thing. Uh, furthermore, there are some fixes around Blazor. So Blazor WebAssembly, um, more and more people are using that. And we keep on uh, changing PNP across the gate to support that where needed. On the usage side, I want to spell out like uh, January is a uh, top month, like 150,000 tenants used uh, our .NET SDKs. That's like a massive, massive number. Uh, part of the growth comes from uh, the developer tenants. So you know that you can instantly get like a developer tenant. And those developer tenants, they tap into PNP Core uh, libraries uh, for doing part of the, their work, part of the provisioning jobs. So that explains the, the high jump, I would say. But uh, it's just like a massive, massive number to see. On the PowerShell side, um, I would like to just maybe also start with the usage. Uh, this was the largest month for PowerShell ever from a number of tenants and from number of requests. So more than 27,000 tenants used PowerShell in January. I think that's our, really our record uh, figure and up to the 30,000, I would say. Um, and then the usage from the commandlets that all of these things are just kind of skyrocketing. And, and so clearly, clearly this is heavily used and people are really depending on PowerShell, which is great. Feature-wise, the team did the usual uh, smaller bug fixes improvements. I don't have a specific list here, um, but maybe next time if you have Urban on the call, we can do some bit, bit more deep dive on, on the actual changes though. So, but yeah, that sums it up, David. Thank you and back to you. Awesome. Thank you, Bert. Let's move into Yo Teams. The latest 3.5 release is out. Now, uh, there's there's some interesting statistics to look at here. Yo Teams is just getting amazing adoption. Uh, what we're seeing is the largest, let me say that again, uh, the largest usage in January 2022, all time high. We've got over 40,000 downloads of the generator, which is fantastic, 40,000 total downloads. If you're looking for a way to develop Teams applications with SPFX, this is a bar none the best. You can learn more at aka.ms forward slash yo teams.
Next, we'll dive into Microsoft Graph Toolkit and we'll hand it over to Seb. Thanks, David. Uh, today, I don't know why there's still snow on that slide. We're going to have to fix it. It's that part of the year, I guess, or part of the country, I guess, right? Yeah, we'll, we'll get that fixed. <laughs> um, so what's new with the uh, Microsoft Graph Toolkit? We're really happy we are shipping our version 2.3.2 on uh, this Friday. The main focus of this release is all about accessibility. So we're really making sure that everybody can leverage the MGT components and that the users of your applications will be able to benefit from all the goodness that accessibility brings to, to make everybody work in the same way to really feel inclusive. Uh, so that's what's coming. That's coming this Friday. So uh, expect a really cool thing. What's next afterwards? Well, well, we still have a couple of accessibility things we want to do on our playground. So where we are uh, working and, and being able to customize some of the components, we're also bringing more fluent components. And we're also working really hard on making our MGT picker very generic, be able to, to uh, connect to any entities from Microsoft Graph. So um, lots to say, but wait for the release for uh, this Friday. I think it's going to be a great one. So. Uh, and also, just a quick plug here, on the 1st of March, we're going to have our AMA. I know you already mentioned it, David, but I'm really, really looking forward to chatting with the community in an AMA style. Back to you, David. Awesome. Thanks, Seb. Yeah, that is always a good time. The AMA sub is awesome, loves to collaborate. Come bring your questions, bring your ideas. Uh, he loves, loves, loves to hear them, so don't, don't hesitate. All right, let's move over to Microsoft Team Samples with Bob German. Hey, so I don't have a lot today. We don't have any new samples, but I will tell you there's a couple of cool ones on the way. And um, here's the location of the solution gallery for everything. And then for just the team samples with some additional filtering options, if you are embarking on a project, don't start from scratch. Take a look at the samples. That's it. Awesome. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, absolutely. Tons of opportunities. And reach out if you have any questions, because we do absolutely want to see those samples. All right, let's samples wanted. See, Parker's even letting us know. Let's move over to Power Platform with April Dunham. Okay, thanks, David. Yeah, we have a few great Power Platform samples uh, this week. So some that I'm excited about that shows the integration with the Microsoft Graph and the Power Platform. So we have one from uh, a couple from Mikhail, actually. So one showing how to use Microsoft 365 groups, getting those with the graph. So the, the connector there for the group connector doesn't allow you to actually create groups. So he gets around that with using the HTTP action. Pretty cool flow there. He also has another one for hiding lists with the site contents. And then three cool Power App samples as well. We have a breadcrumb component by Pavel. We have a self-service portal uh, by Jan Baker. This one is really cool as well. This is using graph integration also to make a self-service hub for adding yourself to groups um, in Azure Active Directory. So really cool sample there using lots of integrations. And then the users and group directory from Siddharth as well, which has some good UI for creating a kind of org chart um, user profile directory. So lots of great samples, and we look forward to seeing your samples in the repo if you have them. Back to you, David. Awesome, thanks, April. And just as you see on the bottom, don't forget there is a Power Platform Contributor Sharing is Caring session February 14th. So a lot of fun. We got some very cool tips in that particular one. So definitely sign up for that. All right, it's everybody's favorite time, picture time. So open up those cameras and Vesa will take over. Yep, I will take over from here. Uh, something which I can contribute on this color scheme. Uh, so <laughs> let's wait for the screen. I will start the recording. Let's not wave uh, yet. Let's wait until we get the fifth states uh, filled. Abby, not yet, not yet, not yet. So I can see you on the third, fourth floor up. So one of the things what we've been trying to uh, do at some point is what about doing a waves like in stadiums uh, from right <laughs> to left? That would be really hard on this one. Um, I guess we are filling in and, and I guess all of the seats are taken. So let's do some hand waving everybody. We're already recording. Thank you for being part of this community. Cool to see the SharePoint <laughs> monkey in the back row as well. So because I'm a familiar face, it's awesome to have you in the community as well. Thank you. Thank you. Really, really cool. Uh, we'll Crap a key for animation out of this and push it in the Facebook and LinkedIn and uh, Twitter and in the blog post as well. So thanks everybody. Awesome to have you here. Thank you, Vesa. And we are just on time. So we are going to move into our demos. Our first demo is going to be by Lee Ford on make a simple bot using webhooks in Teams. Lee, the stage is yours. Take it away. Okay, thank you, David. Um, let me just share my screen one second. 
Okay, yeah. So today uh, I'm going to be talking about building a simple Teams bot using webhooks. And this is something I had to do. Um, I had a demo that I had to do in literally a couple of hours and save going, creating a full fledged bot. I thought, okay, well, let me just see, is it, can I use webhooks? And turns out I could use webhooks. And this is just kind of just a story on uh, uh, why you should use them, why you shouldn't use them, and, and sort of how to get started. So, what, uh, so what is a simple Teams bot? So this is something, this isn't a technical term. This is just something that I kind of coined when I was when I was making it. And what I would deem a simple uh, Teams bot is just a, a simple interaction. So you, you ask the bot a question, it gives you an answer. So for example, uh, what is the weather in London? Okay, it's cloudy and it's five degrees. You know, it could be uh, what is the time in Finland or, you know, whatever. Um, it's just a simple request and response. It's It's nothing more than that. So um, webhooks, why would you use webhooks? So uh, you can use um, outgoing webhooks from inside Teams. Obviously, this is nothing new. It's been around a long time. And the idea of a, an, a, an outgoing webhook, um, if you're not familiar, is to when you can at mention the webhook and then it can go off and effectively do a HTTP request to uh, an external service. That external service could be within Azure, it could be within Amazon, it could be anywhere. Um, as long as it's obviously accessible from the internet. And the idea here is that in our scenario, we're using a webhook, which is actually uh, some code that's then going to return a response in back into Teams. So it, you, you create it with inside a team, you have a security token, security token is then used to validate any requests coming from the webhook to then obviously know that it's come from a, a trusted source. So why would we use a webhook for a bot? Um, that there's this ultimately is it's simple. So if you if you don't want to create a really complex bot, you've literally just got a very simple use case. So for example, asking for the weather forecast, it's it's perfect for that sort of thing where you, you don't really need a, a branching past dialogue and many yeah, multiple questions. It's literally question and answer. So that's one reason. Another reason is time constraints. So you want to quickly build something. As I said, I had a couple of hours to build something and I, I didn't want to go through the process of having to create an app registration and get hold of the people that can grant me access and all that sort of stuff. And this kind of sidesteps a lot of that. And that is also a time saving, but also even if you had all the time in the world, in, not in all scenarios, you actually have access to be able to create an app registration or have access to the Azure a, a portal in that tenant. And the idea here is that any person that's a member or an owner of a team can create an outgoing webhook and then they can literally host their 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 bot wherever they wherever they want. So you're not having to rely on uh, administrators to uh, to grant you access to uh, to create the bot for your tenant. So why would you not use a webhook for a bot? Um, pretty much anything that wasn't in that in, in that previous slide, but ultimately it's things that are going to be more complicated. So like I say, a branching path or an ongoing dialogue or things where you get a notification through from a bot, something like that. You're not really going to get done with a webhook. It's more just a, like I say, a simple interaction. No, another reason is when you're using a webhook, you have, it's part of a team. So it's not really used for personal context. So you couldn't ask sensitive questions because they, anyone that's got access to the bot can then see any interactions, not just their own. Um, and then, and finally, things like scalability. So because it, the webhook is assigned to a particular team, if you wanted then to assign that to 10 teams, then you have to create 10 outgoing webhooks uh, and manage them and manage the secrets and all that. And it just gets really complicated. And in that scenario, you'd be better off having a, a sort of fully fledged bot. So I've created a, a very simple solution here where we're going to get the weather from uh, from an API. Um, in this scenario, it's Open Weather Map API. And the, the simple interaction is you have a user, they're part of a team, they app mention the webhook, the webhook then gets called, it's an Azure function, that then queries the weather API and then returns the the effectively the weather forecast if it's found if if it's a valid location turns the weather forecast back to the team's user in 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 form of a a bot activity or bot framework activity um, and in this case we're attaching an adaptive card to make it uh, a bit more fancy than just text so that ultimately is the solution and what I'm going to do now is just do a quick demo of it um, so let me just 
change over to here. So this is Teams. Um, I've got it running in an Azure function. And if I now, the idea here is that I've created an outgoing webhook. So if I go into my team, under here I have a, one called Weather, very imaginative name. Uh, it's an outgoing webhook. That is then tied to an Azure function. Ultimately, it could be running anywhere, but in this case, it's it's an Azure function. And now within this team, I can at mention the bots. Okay, select the weather bots, and I'm just going to put London, London, the UK, and it will then go off and get the weather and then return. It is a consumption-based function, so there is a little bit of a, a warm-up going on there, but, um, but ultimately it returns the, the weather. And, and so the idea here is that you can put any location in, in, in the world, really. And as long as there's a um, matching location in the API, then it returns the, uh, returns the weather forecast, including any um, sort of icons associated to whatever the weather is for that day. So what I'll do now is quickly just go over the code. It's like I say, it is an Azure function, so it's, it's effectively a single single file in this scenario um, written in TypeScript and I'll just quickly yeah, I've got a massive amount of time to go through line by line but we'll just quickly go through each so um, what we have here is we have an Azure function the first thing we're doing is um, getting the authorization header from the request and also making sure there's a, a body to go along with the request and the reason we need the authorization token is previously I mentioned that uh, an outgoing webhook has a security token and we then have to validate that the request is also from that security token and the way teams handles that is when it sends out an outgoing webhook it encodes the uh the body using uh, the security token and creates a, a hmac um and which is then added to the authorization header and effectively what we do here is we we store the security token uh, sort of with the function it then effectively generates the HMAC of the token and also the message, i.e. the body from the uh, from the request and make sure that, and then we, we effectively make sure that it lines up, that it's from, from the webhook in Teams and not just a random request from, from something else. Once we've validated it, we're then obviously stripping out all the text, stripping out any out mentions and just leaving the location name. We then call the weather API um, with the location name and obviously the API key. If it's a valid location, we then get some more information, sort of the weather forecast you know, for the next week and um, you know what the low and the high is and the percent of chance of rain and whatever else it comes back with. We then collate that data and we put it into an adaptive card. Um, by doing that, we effectively create a data object and then we've got the adaptive card. I won't go through all of it, but ultimately it's a it's, a, it's an adaptive card definition for Teams. We then create a template. We then insert the card data, which has got all the weather information into the into the template. Create a uh, an adaptive card, and then send that card along with the message um, or the activity to Teams. And and we'll, obviously, if there's no location, we say that we can't find it. Otherwise, there's a we throw an error, and that's effectively it from the code. It's it's not a particularly complicated um, setup. It's it's pretty pretty straightforward. And if I just go back to the deck, I think we've got one more slide, which is just to say that there's a company blog post to go through it sort of in more detail. We've also got a code uh, sample on GitHub, and obviously if you need to uh, read more, then uh, yeah, reach out or let me know how you found it. Very, very cool, Lee. Excellent. Thank you so, so much. And, and really showing how, uh, how how quickly you can get a bot up and running and how useful Absolutely. it can be. So very, very nice job. And there's some questions, I think, in the chat. I'll let you review those as we move on to no our worries. next presenter. But thanks again. Very, very excellent. All, All right. right next up is Albert John Schott, or Appy, as we know him to be in our hearts. Use the Power Platform and Microsoft Teams to quiz yourself. Appy, take it yeah. away. There we, uh, there we go. Let me share my screen. One, two, three, there we go. We should be all be good. So recently I did a demo around some Power Platform stuff and I started to think, oh, this is actually an interesting demo. So let's see if we can take it one step uh, one step further. And what I tried to do is I tried to read 
uh, read books and probably, well, not the only one. Uh, the only thing is that when I read a book and like two or three months later, I totally forgot that I've read the book. So I was looking around the solution. Hey, can I get some cues or triggers that I should read more or should be, um, well, at least notified that I've read something, maybe get some inspirational quote or something like that. And apparently there is this app where you can provide the app with what you've been reading and then you get triggers or reminders. Okay, hey, you've read this. Can you remember who wrote this? Uh, can you remember a quote from what book it is? So I started thinking, okay, this is actually an interesting scenario. So I figured out, okay, I keep all my, uh, all my reading, I keep that in Goodreads. And what I did is I, simply synced what I uh, got in Goodreads to a SharePoint list. Now, within the SharePoint list, you'll see that I've got some books and uh, authors, date read, rating. So some, some normal, let's say, metadata around the books that I've been reading. This is just a bunch of metadata. There is no, uh, no fancy logic in there. I didn't do anything with, um, with all the, the cool stuff that you can do with list formatting. It's just plain, plain content. Now, I figured what I wanted to do is I want to get a reminder around something that I've read, read recently, let's say every week or maybe once or twice a month, something like that. So I figured, okay, let's see if I can get a flow that sends me a reminder. Now, going from there, I uh, currently editing the flow. So I created a reading reminder flow and what a flow does is it is pretty straightforward, but there are a few fancy things in there that make uh, that make it fun. So first thing is, OK, I'm going to run it every week. Wednesday, good good moment to reflect on how the week is going. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to get an item from my reading list. I use a random integer, so I at least get some resemblance of a random book in the list that I have. And with that item, I now have my book. I have some metadata around the book. And what I do is I run an HTTP trigger to get some additional information because what I wanted to do is I wanted to quiz myself. So now I've got my book, I know who wrote it. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna call an API where I say, okay, search an API for all authors that have the same name. So I pick the author that I've uh, that that written my book and then I pick his first name or her first name and then query for other authors out there. And Potentially, you get a lot of get a lot of results, but let's uh, let's bear with me. So you get some uh, you get some results. You get some different authors that you can uh, that you can work with. And what you then can do is then you can say, okay, I've got the book that I've read. I've got some additional info, and let's send myself a question. So can I remember who wrote it? Then. In order to do that, you can work with adaptive cards, and we're going to have a look at the adaptive cards in a second. But the important part with adaptive cards is that you actually can ask questions in an adaptive card. So you can ask a user, OK, what is the option or what do you want to provide as an option? So what I did is I created a array with three options, choice one, choice two, and the correct one. And the correct one has the author that is coming from my book, so coming from SharePoint. and the two other authors are actually coming from the API that I call. So I just get a random value or a random author from the list of authors that I uh, that I get. Now, the second thing that I wanted to do, if I would ask this question like this, the third option is always going to be the correct option because the third option in my array has the label correct. So that's not something that I wanted to do. What I want to do is I want to shuffle my array. I want to mix it up a bit, make sure that it's not always going to be the third option when I get uh, get my question. So what I do is I create a random integer between zero and two, so I get three options. And what I then do is, okay, let me randomize my book array. And in order to do that, I have a, a quite large uh, function. So I put it here, so it's a bit more readable. What I'm actually doing, I'm using the skip function with skip you can actually say okay give me everything after a certain uh, starting point so what i have is i have my random start which is between zero and two then i'm going to get everything after that random start and everything before and every time i run this i will get a different random start so i get sort of a random set of uh, of data by using the union, you can then combine everything again. So you have a single array, which is sort of randomized. It's not 100% randomized because, well, I'm um, only doing specific options, but then 
in a way. I still have not always the third option. As a result, it's slightly, slightly different. Then the next thing is there is this adaptive card option. And the adaptive card is uh, it's a it's a JSON schema that you can use. So I didn't do too much time on designing or making it look pretty. The important part is that I make sure that I've got my title. There is some uh, well design around my title, so I make sure that it is bold. Uh, it's a it's extra large. Then you have some text where I make sure okay you you understand the question that you get. And then what you can do is you can actually provide the choices, the options that you want to uh, send the user or present the user with. Now, if I would close this one by then using the send adaptive card, I can say, okay, this is the message. This is my adaptive card. I can do an update message saying, okay, I'm um, happy with the result. Um, and then I've got my recipient. That's going to be me. I'm going to get the uh, get the question. Then what I can then do is, okay, I'm going to wait for that response. And if the response actually is correct, then I'm going to say, okay, you're the winner. And if I did something wrong, then okay, keep trying or try again. Or maybe you could do a link to the book that you've read saying, hey, uh, perhaps you should read it again. Now, if I would run this, then what you will see is I'm going to run it manually. Click next, next, finish. One, two, three. What you actually see, it will get the item. It will get the book info. It will uh, go go through all the different steps, and it will send me that message. So if I now go to Teams, you will see, okay, you read a book. Apparently, I read uh, a Jack Ryan, uh, Jack Ryan thriller. So, okay, who wrote it? Now, obviously, that's going to be Tom Clancy. I'm going to send submit, and then it will probably tell me that I did well. So, well done. Now, I would run it uh, again. Um, what I can do is, okay, let's say run it again, and you will see that if I give a wrong answer, then Obviously, I would get the uh, wrong, wrong experience saying, OK, you did something wrong. Please try again. So uh, the only downside is that I now have two Lee child. So I honestly have no clue what's the correct one. Uh, sure, this one is wrong. And I will say, OK, uh, well, you failed. Now, what I really like around this sample is that it is pretty straightforward in steps that I need to take. I have a recurrence, making sure that it runs every week or every two weeks. I'll get a random book that I've read recently, and obviously, I'm now uh, I'm now querying my SharePoint list. I could also query my Goodreads feed, where I get all the all the data for, because Goodreads provides you with an XML feed of all the stuff that you've read. Then I get some additional info, make sure that I shuffle my answers, send myself an adaptive card, and then. Just work with uh, work with the data. Now, let me go to my flows, and let me go to my imports because I cheated a bit. I didn't want to run my import every time. If you actually wanted to play around with Goodreads, you'll need an HTTP trigger. But what you will see is that Goodreads is just a RSS feed. And what you then can do is, if you would go there, what you will see is it's plain. XML, you get a bunch of data. Now, let me uh, talk a little bit. So all the data that you actually need is already here. So instead of using SharePoint, if you don't want to use a SharePoint list as your uh, as your storage layer, you could use this XML file as well. Just get the XML file with everything that you've read. And what you then can do is this one, I think. So the next step is that, OK, for each item in that XML, you'll need to work with XPAT queries. So what I'm going to do is, OK, it's RSS. So let me select that one so it's a bit more readable. What you see is that, OK, I did an HTTP request and I'm going to select all items in my HTTP or in my XML file. Then I'm going to create a SharePoint a uh, list item based on the item in my RSS feed. And in order to do that, what you can do is then you can just say, OK, uh, in my for each, I'm going to create an item and I'm going to do an XPath. Now this time I'm going to select my for each item and then I'm going to say, OK, in this case, I want to get the item title and I want to get a text. Or if I want to get the author, then I can do the item author name and this one actually matches with what you see here. So I've got my item element, then I've got an author name, I've got my title, I've got things like uh, 
what I've given as a rating, I've got stuff that, okay, when did I actually read it? Because you could use dates to see when you read something. So it's a really easy way without having to write really complex code to send yourself uh, cards, quiz yourself on what you've, what you've read or what you've been doing. And well, for me, it was a really, uh, well, I like, the, I like the scenario of getting, uh, getting something in my team's environment that easy and that quick. Um, I think I spent like an hour on, on getting the flow out there and doing some stuff with this. Probably spend another hour figuring out how to shuffle things because it's a bit, well, it wasn't apparently a scenario that a lot of people do. You see a lot of samples out there that explains, okay, you can use an Azure function to shuffle. And well, I wanted to stay away with uh, away from any development and wanted to play around with, uh, with the flow only. And that's it. Let me see if there are questions. There are lots of uh, amazing chat and uh, some questions in there, Appy. So thank you. Very, very cool. I really like how uh, malleable and, and pliable this is, right? So you're using it for books, but someone could use it for videos uh, or movies, or they could use it for, I don't know, Microsoft 365 community videos if you wanted to quiz yourself Definitely. and keep up to date with those. I was even thinking I could tweak it to just remind my kids of all the chores that they didn't do and quiz them on things that they should be doing. So win-win, right? Excellent. That's work as well. Yeah, very, very cool. Thank you so, so much. All right, next up is Natalie and Troy. We're going to get some updates on the independent publisher connectors and see a double dose of demos today, Cloverly and Ecology. So take it away. Thanks, David. Great to be back. Hi, everyone. Um, so for those of you who don't know what an independent publisher connector is, it's essentially just a custom connector that's submitted through this program. And the great thing about this is that anyone can submit it. You don't need to actually own the API to submit this connector. So super happy to announce that we have 72 connectors in production, up 23 from the last time we chatted. Um, and we have the list of them down here. Um, so QuickBase has been one that a lot of customers have been asking for. So thank you, Troy, for putting that one out. And of course, Troy has built more than one connector, as you can see by this list here. Super excited to also have the Star Wars connector and a couple of environmental sustainability connectors as well. And, you know, we have to always thank and congratulate our 35 outstanding publishers for publishing great connectors. I have all their names on the list on the right. So it's super awesome to see this community grow and to have so many connectors out there. Uh, we also have 29 connectors in the certification pipeline. Um, so we got a couple of new ones this week, specifically Clockify and Infura Ethereum. So it's super excited to also see the, the blockchain type of connectors coming in our way. And so, as David mentioned, today we have a double dose. So Troy Taylor is here today to do a demo on both the Cloverly and the Ecology connectors that he's built. So Troy, take it away. Yep, thanks, Natalie. Just a second to share my screen. Yeah, so I'm here today to present uh, two connectors that I've built. Uh, both of these sort of fall into the environmental theme for, for connectors. Uh, about myself, I'm Troy Taylor. I'm a senior power platform consultant at Hitachi Solutions. I'm based out of State College, Pennsylvania, and I am a project coordinator for the Independent Publisher Connector Project, and I'm also a contributor. Uh, like Natalie said, I've submitted and had a bunch of connectors released. These, I think, is an updated list, but I think I just submitted my 40th connector. Um, so we have a lot of good things coming out, and uh, I'm looking forward to some of them. So let me talk about the, the two services that I'm going to be demoing today. So Cloverly is a relatively new service. They're calling itself a sustainability as a service platform. It allows you to make calculations and to purchase carbon offsets to uh, neutralize the environmental impact of everyday activities. And the API has endpoints for a lot of different calculations, including packaging shipping, uh, merchant category codes, freight shipping, travel activities, uh, such as staying overnight at a hotel, going on a flight uh, or vehicle transportation, and also has a calculator for electricity usage. Uh, the 
The API allows you to direct purchase uh, by carbon amount or transaction amount, including uh, whatever your local currency is. I think it's up to five or six currencies at this point. And all of these endpoints uh, allows you to make calls at either as an estimate or to do the, the purchase through the same endpoint. You just change that, that one variable. Switching now and talking about ecology. Ecology is slightly different in terms of the service. Um, they're mostly a subscription service. So they're trying to get people to, you know, just like you pay for Netflix or you, you pay for, for Disney Plus, uh, you know, another subscription to add that you, you pay every month to help fund uh, the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, mostly through tree planting. Um, and that's, uh, that's their claim to fame and difference between this and Cloverly. Um, so not only is it a subscription, which you know is great, um, they also through the API allows you to do a pay-as-you-go service. So you can you can purchase trees and purchase carbon offsets uh, as you go as well. Um, the other difference between this and Cloverly is uh, the reporting uh, is available through the API. Um, so that's good for organizations who might want to get uh, reports for, for what their users have been doing. Okay, so I'm going to switch now and go do a demo. Okay, so here you can see, um, so I've made a calculator app uh, with a notepad scratch pad there on the right. So the calculator, let's think about that in terms of the Cloverly service. So the calculator, you know, allows calculations for uh, package shipping, for freight transportation, for uh, travel distance and miles through a car, and then electricity. So we're going to uh, we're going to call the service. We're going to call the Cloverly service now, uh, based off of this electricity usage, so 56 uh, kilowatts uh, used. We're going to equal sign. This will update as soon as it gets the response back. Yep. So uh, there we go. So it's 44 cents is the equivalent. Uh, uh, that's the carbon dioxide equivalent um, for that usage. Now that you you know you've made your calculations, you you have a running total. You can either purchase trees or purchase carbon offsets through the ecology service. But um, let's go ahead. Um, so this equals button, I have it set up um, to run off of Power Automate just so that you can see it a little easier. So you can see, you know, in, in this run, this is an old run, um, the, the value that the calculator had, it was 873 kilowatts. Then you get all sorts of information back from the API in terms of, you know, total cost, transaction costs. There are, you know, the service itself does have a cost itself. And um, it also gives you uh, what type of project that you're funding as well is available through uh, that Cloverly API. Okay, let's take a look at the services now. So Cloverly, here you can see the transactions. These are all the API calls, you know, that I was making as a test. Let's see if we can refresh it and see if that last one. Oh, there's transactions are the service. It's a little slow sometimes, but yeah, you can see uh, you can see uh, the estimated 44. That that run right there is, has already populated in the transaction report. Going over to the ecology, taking a look at, at this service, uh, you can see here, you know, my account here is set up as a pay-as-you-go account. Um, so you can see all of the trees that I've purchased, uh, and it'll even allows you to drill down. So it's a specific tree number that they've planted for you, uh, the type of tree, where it is on the map, and you know, and the project. So, so a, a tree I purchased is is was planted in Madagascar, which is which is kind of cool to to go through and, and see for that reporting. Okay, I'm going to switch back. So uh, that's all of my demo. Just to let you know, these two connectors are still in the certification pipeline. They were submitted. Um, we had a little delay in the train, um, so these actually are not available yet, but I'm hoping that they're available within the next three or four weeks. And if if you do have any questions about these connectors or any of the connectors that I've built, if you have ideas for services that don't have a connector, you're certainly welcome to reach out to me, send me an email or I'm on Twitter. And there you go. Uh, David, back to you.
Awesome. Thank you, Troy and Natalie, both very, very much. Uh, this is really, really cool. Uh, love the creativity there as well. So let me share back out the slides here. And I think there are some questions there for you, uh, Troy and Natalie, in the chat. So I'll let you take a look at those. Uh, we'd like to thank all of our presenters today, Lee, Appy, Natalie, and Troy. Really, really amazing stuff. The recording will be available in 24 hours at the Microsoft 365 Community YouTube channel, aka.ms forward slash m365pnp forward slash videos. Don't forget to subscribe. It'll always let you know when new videos are added, so you don't have to worry about going and checking. We will let you know. You can always follow us on Twitter at Microsoft365Dev or at Microsoft365PNP. The next general dev call, this call you are on two weeks from today, February 17th at 7 a.m. Pacific. The next Viva Connections and SharePoint Framework call will be one week from today, February 10th at 7 a.m. Pacific as well. You can find all the community calls at aka.ms forward slash m365pnp. You can also get to our other community calls at the same URL or these direct URLs. The platform call, which is the Microsoft direct call with Microsoft presenters, aka.ms forward slash m365-dev-call. And we have a number of other calls as well. Adaptive cards, Microsoft identity platform, office add-ins, power apps, and then of course the two PNP community calls that are bi-weekly, the Microsoft 365 community, which is this one you're on now, and the VP Connections and SharePoint framework, which is the opposite week. So thank you everybody for the amazing collaboration and conversation in the chat today. Thank you again for our amazing presenters. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next week. Thank you for being awesome.